Hello everyone, Scott Luthold here with Forexpedition. Welcome back to another episode on our YouTube and Facebook channel. Today I'm coming to you from Boundary Waters Canoe Area, which is in northern Minnesota, right on the border of Minnesota and Canada. I'm up here uh, this week. I'm doing a seven-day paddle with two of my friends, Dana and Dave. We planned this trip two years ago, but unfortunately Dana got into a Harley-Davidson accident with a deer going about 70 miles an hour. So needless to say, we had to cancel the trip and uh, it's been about two years now and we decided to get it back on the books. So I'm up here this week. Yesterday I left uh, Arizona around three o'clock in the morning, took two airplane flights and uh, flew up to Duluth, Minnesota. Dana picked me up in Duluth and we headed up here and got out into the wilderness. And this morning we're heading out on the water. We'll be spending a lot of time on some big open water, doing some fishing. Uh, hopefully we'll be catching fish at least once a day to eat a meal. Uh, I've never been to the Boundary Waters area myself. This is the first time. I've got a lot of friends and family who spend a lot of time up here. And as you all know, I'm originally from Wisconsin and spent a lot of time in northern Wisconsin. And actually have spent quite a bit of time in northern Minnesota, just not up at the Boundary Waters. We're using canoe backpacks by a company called Granite Gear. These backpacks are really, really durable. They're actually made with Kevlar. And uh, they're much wider and larger than a typical backpack. So one of the things we decided to do, since it's just the three of us, is take a 20-foot Kevlar boat. This will be a little bit more reminiscent of the Voyager days. We'll be putting in on Little Sioux River, and we'll be taking the boats out on Moose River. And uh, we'll be doing a pretty big loop, which I'll show you here in just a little bit. So if you want to sit back in your armchair once again and enjoy the ride, I've got a really nice video put together here for you. Our entry point is right here. We got a 40 rod portage coming down Little Sioux, and we got a 60 rod, and we got an 8, and we're going 150, and then we're in water to 50, and then we're up to Lac LaCroix. We're going to come around here, we're going to follow the border. And our next night, maybe we were we're going to have a big we day here. here. Looking for these here. paintings. And we're going to stay right, up on us. right there, which is my favorite he gave me a thing. campsite. Okay, and there's Indian paintings that's on both sides. Cool. And that's good. We're going to spend our labor day. Cool. And then we're going to come in here, come down through here, I come down through here, the in down into Nina Moose, Moose, and then take this river, which is going to be fun in that 22 foot canoe. <laughs> All the way down to right there. That's the takeout? That's the takeout. Nice. Yeah. We didn't catch any of it. Really? Yeah. about right? Randy oil. You hear me, Dave? Yeah. And I've got two. Like this? Yeah. Found a aerial you of or something? The oldest sister, yeah. Yeah. The Mormon. <laughs> All right, so we're on our first portage. This one's probably in the neighborhood of about 60 rods. And our rod is basically equivalent to about 16 feet. So uh, not real far. Um, but we did have to go around a, um, a pretty uh, significant rapid and waterfall. Heading down the trail now here along the creek that we were paddling on earlier, but it's uh, a nice rushing stream here.
<laughs> and let us buy. Tomorrow there's two partages, 40 and 160. And then the next day, it's all paddling. We'll be right along the border. The U.S. LaCroix? Yeah, that's Lac LaCroix. And we're going to camp right down here. Then we'll have our layover day down there. Gotcha. 14, where we took a 40 rod portage. Mm -hmm. Then we were in that river, meandered up that river. And that 60 rod portage. We entered up that river. We entered up there. That's Tomorrow we're saying. gonna take this 40 rod portage. Oh, that's port. a narrow. I didn't realize how narrow that was. Yep. We're gonna do this. And then it's 160, but the guy said you can kind of hopscotch there. They couldn't find the portage. Okay. And then we'll get in the, in, into Lac LaCroix. And we'll follow it up there. Oh, I guess there is a 50 rod right here. So we'll have three portages tomorrow. We decided to keep the trip a little bit shorter on the first day. We did two portages. We've only gone a couple miles, but uh, we're on a really nice lake here. Found a great camp spot up on a, uh, a nice rock outcropping. High up in, the, uh, up in the air, probably a little more breezy than a lot of places. Does a good job to keep the flies and the mosquitoes out of the way. But we're here just kicking back. We're going to have a nice, uh, nice dinner. I'm sure we'll have a beautiful sunset right here. And then um, tomorrow we get up and uh, we'll be heading down the way to another portage, cross over to another lake, and um, we'll be back on the, on the paddling trail. It's actually probably about 75, 78 degrees right now. Pressure is pretty high, so we're not really expecting any storms. There are some predicted storms for maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, but we'll see about that. You know, as we paddle along here, it's really interesting to listen to the stories that both Dana and Dave share of their experiences up here in the Boundary Waters. And you know, one can't really help but appreciate the nostalgia of bringing family up here and having memories created. That's what the Northwoods of Wisconsin and Minnesota do for you. It creates these wonderful nostalgic memories that uh, one cherishes for the rest of their life. Blow or something? Got a sharp knife for the oh there it is. Okay, yeah. thing. Where's my fork? Well, oh, here's here. It's about nine o'clock in the evening. Dana and Dave have gone to bed. I'm uh, probably gonna hit the hay here in a little bit. It's kind of odd to think about going to bed with it uh, so light out, but we're getting up fairly early tomorrow morning. We're gonna do a little paddle across the lake over here and then do a short portage into another lake and then head up stream to Lac La Croix. It's just an incredibly peaceful evening out here. It, one of the things I absolutely love about this lake is that there's not a single home not a single dock, not a single other person other than the three of us on this lake. It's absolutely peaceful, incredibly quiet. Every once in a while I can hear one bird, but other than that, it's just, there's no sounds on this lake. It's just deafeningly quiet. I could just spend a week sitting right here at this very spot.
he's going to put his tent between two trees. He's got a sleeping bag that you buy at Kmart for sleepovers. And we looked at it, as Dave and I looked at each other and says, this little shit will freeze to death. That one goes to the lower end, you gotta kinda, probably about as, see the paddle from here to there, it's probably the same, we gotta paddle the way back. Let's make sure there's no other portages besides that eight rod one. Looks like we spotted a bald eagle here. I'm trying to come up on him so he can fly away. Second bald eagle I've seen in a month. Damn old, old geezers. <laughs> Taught me a lesson. Never go with a bunch of old again. <laughs> Super. I was wondering how long it takes to spin that off. <laughs> Very peaceful morning. I haven't seen very many people at all this morning. In fact, we haven't seen anyone. Beaver dam. Nope. All right, looks like we're at the end of the second lake here. I'm gonna be doing a portage on the right side. There's a rapids up ahead here. Right out in there. There's a rock here. Okay. Yeah, it's right here. No, no. Yep. Okay, Dan, you need help? You got it. Come here, you big stud. <laughs> well, you call us a bunch of old guys. <laughs> Right there. Bunch of old guys. You go, boy. Dana won't let anybody else carry the boat. He's a control freak. Make sure we got everything here. So, I got a big freaking backpack on the front and a big freaking backpack on the back. I'm carrying a paddle. So it's not terribly long, but we are bypassing a rapid. And um, the guys were just telling me a story about a guy who missed that portage and went down the rapids here and got himself into some pretty big trouble. Carrying my pack and Dana's pack so he can carry the 20-foot boat. It's a little precarious through here. 
last thing you want to do is slip and fall or sprain your ankle out here in the middle of nowhere because you're not carrying much if you do that so you know I could certainly see myself coming out here at some point doing a solo paddle for a couple of days oh look at this that's down through a pretty narrow gorge there it looks like it gets pretty gnarly up here lugging along about 90 pounds here Dana's pack's probably 30 pounds my pack's about 60 pounds and I'm still managing to film and carry an oar look at that beautiful thing this is a long portage Well, I got to the top, and there's a long descent down to the water, and I had to set down to in his pack. I'll have to go back and get it. I gotta tell you, I may give these guys a ration of for uh, being old guys, but they're both a couple of mountain goats. No problem hauling their They drop something, they fall over or something like that, covered in blood on their arms, and they get up and just keep going. No big deal. So I made it. I gotta go back halfway and get your bag. Okay. That's a pretty good landing. And there we are, down below. We made it. Down here with the pussy willows. Yep. Ah. We made it. All right, I'm heading back up the hill to get Dana's pack. Thought maybe I would see if I could look off the cliff up here and see what we portaged around. I think it was a pretty significant waterfall in a, in a gorge. Plus Dave's back here a little ways. I'm going to check on him, see how he's doing. Just passed by Dave. He's got a lot of crap he's hauling. Pick this baby up. Maybe go check out that cliff. Here we are, I can hear the rushing water. Nice camp spot up here. So clearly people do the portage halfway camp here and then carry their stuff down to the bottom in the morning. All right, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You can hear the water. Oh yeah. Oh man, beautiful. That's pretty treacherous stuff. Right up here by this camp. Nice little raspberries. Yum, yum, yum. Pick a couple of these little babies. This is a good place for a bear to hang out. This morning we had blueberries. Just growing everywhere here. Shut up and paddle. Right. Meander out, then we gotta stay to the left when we get out there. We'll see it, Dave. We doing any fishing today? Yep. Yep. Is that why you took the middle seat? Yep. <laughs> yeah. I just took it because I think I want it. I might try to snoozle. I don't sleep at all after. Snoozle badoozle. Why do you call it the garbage man seat? Because you are like garbage. You don't do anything, you just sit here like garbage. <laughs> Although with this long boat. Three guys paddling, man. We we were booking. Oh, we're yeah. moving, yeah. Well, we'll see how we can do with two men. Moving like the Voyagers. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm. I bet a lot of people would say my commute. Dana didn't sleep well last night. He had a hole in his in his screen on his hammock, and uh, inside his. Screen hammock. It was like Grand Central Station in there with mosquitoes. And he was teaching me recently about mind over matter. I think he's got it down. So this is the first time I've seen him take a break in the boat since we got here. 
I think the antidote for mosquito toxin is called Corvell. Corvell. <laughs> That's right. Just don't smear it all over yourself because the bear's like that. It has to be used internally. <laughs> it has to be used internally. <laughs> He's not afraid. Painted turtle. Wow, he's a good size one. Um, you know, and, and here's one example he uses. He was, you just don't know the backstory on people and you should give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Uh, and his, this, this example is where he went on a, a bus and the, he was reading his paper and the bus stopped and two kids and a dad got on and the two kids were just unruly. They were jumping on the chairs and just running up and down the aisles and the dad was just sitting there lackadaisical and Covey got upset about it and he looked over at the guy and said, you know, if you can't discipline those kids, I'll help you. And the guy said, you know what, that would be a big help for me. We just left the hospital where their mom died. Oh, wow. You know. It's having compassion, too, yeah, you know. To, and I always tried to give my students the benefit of the doubt. Hold them accountable. Yeah, hold the kids accountable, but, but also have compassion for the parents. Exactly. You know, sometimes you go to the mall and you see a, some kids just screaming their heads off and you see a lot of people rolling their eyes about it. And, you know, I get it. I get that. But at the same time... If you've never raised kids, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. Right. You try, you're in the middle of a mall, and they're going to throw a tantrum. You can't do a whole hell of a lot about it. Right. And right over there through that cove. There, right there. That's Canada. They were remarking about how different it looks compared to everything else. <laughs> we were looking for the borderline on the lake, but just can't seem to find it. Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. See, that's got more than a 25 horse on it. So, so this is the first power boat we've seen. Things flying. It's a power boat that has some canoes up on the roof. Eleven o'clock. We're coming to eleven o'clock. Yep, exactly. Eleven o'clock is ported. So where is he taking them back to that way? Crane Lake. So back to Zubs. Mm -hmm. So tell me about this bread. Hudson Bay bread is high energy. Okay. It has almonds, mapleine, oats that you that you put in a blender. Okay. And then you put sugar butter and corn syrup and you cook it at 350 for about 20 minutes okay where'd you come up with this this is what we had back in 1968 from barbara ann bakery out of ely minnesota nice did i say honey i might have missed honey there's honey in there too So here we are at the portage. On the left side is Canada, on the right side is the US. Uh, 50 pounds for? 68, I think. Oh, it is 68 pounds. You okay in the wind there, buddy? I'm gonna let you walk. I'll move my pack if you need it. What they have here is for uh, power boats literally bring your boat up through this lake just this area this is part of the lake is power boat accessible but you put your boat in here you put it on this little guy and for a fee you can transport your boat from this lake over to 
Lac La Croix, which is an enormous lake. And there's certain parts of Lac La Croix that allow power boats as well. And some of the power boat area is only accessible for Native Americans, but there are some areas that general power boat usage is allowed. We are the champions. Yes, we are. Guess what? You get to take a nap. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> the bow of the boat is the front. Yeah. The stern of the boat is the back. Don't be so stern, Dave. And if you want port, it's left. I thought you drink port. Starboard is right. This technically is a canoe. It's not a boat. It's in the classification of canoe. Thank you very much. So I was going to tell you a little bit about this life jacket. And this is this is Dana's life jacket. You know how I know? It's, it's got his name right there. I think we found a spot we're gonna camp for the night. It's got a government great kitchen, but clearly this camp spot's not been used that much. Plenty of firewood. It's mostly flat rock. Dana sleeps in a hammock, so he's gotta find a couple of trees. I got it. Thank you. Dreaming. Dreaming. Hey, to a good day. It was nice. a good day of paddling. It was a good day of paddling. It really was. It was good portaging, paddling. Good we did good. I'm not, get, I'm not getting up. Cheers. Just call me Big Cup. Big Cup. Just Ooh. call me Brown Cup. Well, we made it to another camp. It's Monday afternoon. Uh, we got out on the Lac LaCroix and uh, had a hard time finding a camp actually, but um, we got really far back into a cove here and just a fantastic little camp spot. We haven't seen anyone, well, we saw one motorboat uh, a couple hours ago, and then before that we saw one person at a portage probably halfway through the day. That's pretty much it. What is just so striking to me about um, coming up here and doing this paddling is just how much fresh water there is and how few people there are. I'm just, I'm just in awe constantly of the fact that there's all these beautiful lakes, there's no homes on them, there's no docks, there's no water skiers, there's nothing, just wilderness. It's just wilderness and it just goes on and on and on and the water's clean and it's, it's warm and it's just a fantastic place to hang out and swim. I just got done with a nice swim, got all freshened up. And now we're sitting here um, at a camp that we found uh, on the map. It was on the map. When we got here, there was a government grate for a campfire, but um, it looks like this camp has not been used in years. And that's pretty much what we've discovered about a lot of the little camp spots we found around here. A lot of them have never or haven't been used in a long, long time. They're all overgrown, which is just a fantastic aspect of being here. It's just so desolate and so few people it's just unbelievable so uh if you haven't had an opportunity to come up here i definitely definitely recommend it in fact i'll be coming up here probably several more times over the next couple of years and um, i expect to do a lot of exploring back in the back country here with a boat so here's dana's camp spot he's got a hammock uh, with a tarp over the top and then he's got a bug net on top of that 
And, um, you know, there's some really interesting things to point out about the camping system you choose. So Dana's got the camp hammock set up, and then I've got a ultralight backpacking tent that requires staking down. And then Dave's got a, a two-man a two tent that is a partial freestanding tent. And um, when you get to a camp spot like this, in Dana's case, he's got to find two trees. He's got to make sure that he has enough strap to um, stretch between the trees that he does find. And then he's got to find some system for hanging the uh, the tarp over the top in case it rains. Now, if uh, you look at the rest of this camp spot, which I'll show you here shortly, there really wasn't much in the way of um, a flat tent camping area that was on any kind of soft ground. It's all rock. So basically what I had to do is I had to rig up my stake tent with, uh, I had to pull in some large rocks, large heavy rocks. I'm, I'm actually camping on the hard surface. And I had to use rocks and some paracord around the rocks to hold the tent up. And then Dave found a spot that's relatively flat. It's a little more soft ground. He was able to do a little bit of staking, I think. And then the rest of it, I think, is just freestanding. So, you know, think a lot about what you choose as a camp system when you come out to a place like this. A freestanding tent's probably a little smarter. I have, um, the one I have is, is an ultralight backpacking tent by Big Agnes. Uh, and I, th I think it's called the Firefly or something like that. And then um, I also have back home, I have an REI two-person half dome, which is a freestanding tent. That might have been a little bit better to bring along. However, it also been a little bit heavier. A lot of people like to use hammocks. I think hammocks are great, uh, although I don't sleep in them very well, so I don't use them. Uh, but, uh, you know, in some cases, you're not really going to find two good trees to stretch your hammock between. And uh, if you do, sometimes it'll be in a real thick forest area that has a lot of mosquitoes like uh, Dana experienced last night so I remember the first portages I did geez they were ugly the only pain in the ass was, you know, we think we find a spot. Well, no, we got to yeah, paddle across this bay. Right. Yeah. Oh, we think we find a spot. No, we got to paddle off that bay. You know, it's over and around the next. It's around the next bend. But, but you know, that's just psychological. Right, and you know, it's different if you do it at seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night. Yeah. And you're just kind of desperate to get a spot. Yeah. And then you come around the bay, and then there's somebody in the spot. That gets to be a long that... day. That's happened to me. I've literally raced people to a campsite <laughs> with my canoe, where we'll we'll be like in the mouth of this bay, and we'll race, and I'll put Thomas in the bow of my canoe, and we'll we'll win. We'll get there first. <laughs> and then if you get there, Never, what happens to them? They have to turn around they and go, to somewhere, go else. somewhere else. Yeah, I, and they look only... at you. And and I've I've done that probably half a dozen times. I was telling you, I think it may have been when we were with. I know, I know. It was two, on Table Rock. No, down this, in it was. We did it on Nina Moose, and I think it was Mark Tudor and Sean. They had a Winona 18 or 17 and a half, and we saw the other guy come off of the portage, and there's the campsite, and we come off, and we just said, "Mark, go." <laughs> so he and uh, Little Mark just or, or uh, Sean just, just boosh, boosh, boosh. And after a while, the other people find what we give, we give, <laughs> we give. hear him snoring in Chicago from here but it is so unbelievably quiet otherwise that I can hear sounds of things happening on the far side of the lake and there's no people anywhere around here it's all it's all just wildlife or I mean it's got to be wildlife because there's no there's no breeze there's no waves there's no current there's nothing it's just totally completely still and just scoping around to the other side of the shoreline to see if maybe a moose or a bear or something like that is 
coming down to get a drink of water. In this book, there's an excerpt that reads, We all have the ability to consciously know ourselves as we move through life. The capacity to witness the unfolding of our lives is not an ability that is remote or hidden from us. To the contrary, this is an experience that is so close, so intimate, and so ordinary that we easily overlook its presence and significance. An old adage states, It's a rare fish that knows it swims in water. On this shore? On the left. You know, I want to go right down kind of the middle of the lake. He says 20 f***ing years ago he took you to that restaurant you haven't forgotten about it. No, when I got that bill I almost f***ed my pants. you like that? My credit card limits were like 500 bucks. <laughs> You're saying that's three weeks on the boundary waters. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, here. Uh oh. I might need to do some mediation We're here. We're talking about 20 years ago. I didn't buy anything 20 years ago. came down right through here and along, cut around underneath these islands I got it now, Danny. over here. And we came down, this was a lot of tailwind here. And then uh, what you just saw, we just cut right through right there. Uh, I personally think that's the island. Yeah. That's a little inlet and yeah. the gap itself we just can't see because it's right on the other side of the So as we come around the top side of Lac LaCroix and start heading south back into the heart of the Boundary Waters, we're gonna start seeing a lot more people. We just passed by a campsite that had probably six canoes, <clears throat> but according to the guys' maps and their past experience, there's a lot of campsites around here, so we shouldn't have much trouble finding a place to camp. So uh, that's what we're doing. We have had a fantastic day today paddling. We did a lot of big water. The wind goddess blessed us with her tailwinds the entire day. We were probably moving along at about four knots and uh, we made our way about 12 miles in a fairly short amount of time. So we're coming in to camp a little bit ahead of schedule. One thing you can count on for sure is that for the entire day of your trip, your feet are gonna be soaking wet. So be sure you bring yourself along some camp shoes so you can dry that out. And foot powder. And foot powder. I have foot powder. Yeah? I do. And it feels wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Got some nice seating here. It's a good spot, Danny. Hey, it works. I like the breeze. Yep. Some nice, beautiful pines here. I'm glad we're not paddling. <laughs> I paddled enough today. <laughs> All right, so here we are on Tuesday afternoon. We finally got to our camp, we found a spot. So tomorrow's probably gonna be our layover day. We'll stay here all day tomorrow. We might do a little bit of paddling back up the lake here 
And on the Canadian side, there's some Native American pictographs that uh, Dana told me he really would like me to see. Now, we're not allowed to get off the boats on the Canadian side. We are allowed to go over there and just kind of float by. They're on a cliff wall right against the water. So we're gonna take a look at those and then we're gonna come back across. What I'm really hoping to do is put a couple of cameras on these guys and let them really just share stories from their past. And I think that's a really important part of this trip for me is going with a couple of gentlemen who have been here for years and years, every year coming out here either alone or with their friends and family and really building uh, beautiful bonds with people, creating amazing memories with their families. And that's really the value of this area, really, in my opinion. Northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, what it's really all about is creating family memories and that nostalgia of old lodges, old cabins that families go to year after year after year and create these wonderful stories with generation after generation. Oh, no. Do you want forks or spoon? Spoon. We have quinoa. Okay. Quinoa with a little milk and alfredo sauce to just give it a little creaminess. All right. Sounds good so far. And we're going to add curry. Okay. And cranberries. Wow. Okay. And chicken. Chicken too, huh? Right. Get some protein. Yes. Nutritious. Cody, cranberries, quinoa, chicken. Mmm, you're going to like this. And alfredo sauce. And a little Alfredo just for consistency. It's interesting Good stuff. Some of these sites are in Spot Gen 3, I'm going to turn it on now. About 200 bucks. Uh, kind of the low end of these sorts of devices. Um, you can probably double your money, spend twice as much for back and forth, but it's connected through satellites. Okay. It's not cell phone. This one's pretty simple. If I hit the OK button, this is a pre-programmed uh, message. Mm -hmm. I put in emails to my wife, my daughter, my son, and it says, I'm OK. If you want to know where I'm at, here's my GPS location. And if you click on that, it goes right to Google Maps. Nice. Okay. And, and you literally, they probably could zoom right into the campsite. The real key is... You flip that button, and that's an SOS button. If I punch that, it sends a message to all the appropriate rescue societies that says, I'm here, and we have an emergency. My guess is pressing that button probably would cost ten to $15,000 for somebody to come in here and take us out. Blink in there. Means it was sent. Message sent. So all the people on your list that you put in the, on the website or something like that yep. know now where you're located and that you're doing okay. If if I get in trouble, I really can get out of trouble. Yeah, you can get out. I mean, 15000 bucks is well, nothing you know, when whatever. you want to save your life. I swear to God. Yeah. We got something here. Yeah. We got bass. Back here. We want to. There you go. Look at that. Let's see it. There we go. Breakfast. Breakfast of champions, right there, right? Good catch, Scott. <laughs> Get them in the net, you lift the net up. There you go. Okay. Now. <laughs> All right.
right, so let's talk mosquitoes for a minute, shall we? So, the mosquitoes here are fierce, but they're not bad in the morning, they're not bad all day long, they're not even bad in the evening, but right around 9 o'clock, 9.30 or something like that, I kid you not, there is the loudest hum that comes out of the forest, and they just come out in freaking swarms. It's really, really crazy. I mean, we're talking like you gotta be in your tent by the time you hear that swarm because they will attack you like freaking killer bees. Now, my buddy Dana told me something. He's like, it's all mind over matter, which, you know, for the most part, I actually tend to agree with him. They were biting me like crazy when we first got on the trail. And uh, the most important thing is I noticed that I didn't get any welts. Uh, yeah, they did bite me and I did sweep them off my arms and legs and whatnot. And I did keep a long sleeve shirt and long sleeve pants on quite a bit. However, at 9.30 at night, all bets are off. And these two guys, they're in their tents, zipped up, and then all of a sudden you hear the hum and it's nuts. And I'm going to try to show you out my tent window right now with my headlamp just how serious this is. All right, you see all that flying around there, my friends? All right. So this is just outside my screen. And uh, I decided to climb inside my tent because every single one of those things flying by, those are female mosquitoes looking to bite me and suck my blood. All right, so that's that. A couple uh, mosquitoes were inside my tent, so I smashed them and smeared blood all over the inside of my tent walls. You know, but oh well, not a big deal. It's just like mass carnage in here. And um, I can also hear the sound of loons calling out there among the, uh, the buzz of the mosquitoes and of course the snore of my bros in their tents outside around me. And uh, between the three of those, it's uh, a midnight sonnet. <laughs> that I'll uh, enjoy falling asleep to. So um, until tomorrow, tomorrow morning we'll be getting up and eating those bass that I caught. I'm really excited about that. Uh, Dana will be uh, carving those babies up on his canoe paddle. <laughs> so that should be a lot of fun. But until tomorrow morning, we'll, we'll talk to you later. Good night. I think I'll stay in bed a little longer. These little mosquitoes are still pretty hungry this morning. Well, it's morning and there's a lot of mosquitoes outside my tent. I'm happy to say that, uh, however, so far on this trip I haven't used DEET once. I don't really intend to use DEET this entire trip. And so, in fact, I've only put bug spray on me twice. And that was when we first got here. But ever since then, I just basically, uh, when the mosquitoes are pretty thick, I just wear pants and a long sleeve shirt pretty much does the trick. So you don't really have to put poisonous chemicals on your body in order to keep mosquitoes off your body. You can uh, wear some long sleeves and some long pants and then uh, then just do some mind over matter work, you know what I'm saying? That pretty much kill it? Yeah, that's its brain. It'll have some, you know, reactions, but yeah, that pretty much stops it from flopping around. Here we go. Breakfast of champions. Yeah. So 
So we're watching a bald eagle that's up on that tallest tree there on the other side of the bay. He's up there. Cranberry and the pancakes. Cranberry pancakes are good. We got some homemade pancakes and smallmouth bass. It's on a lot by us, but it just shows boxes being delivered and the doorbell being rung. I was up at camp thinking about fishing and thought maybe I'd come down and talk to you a little bit about it. I thought maybe I might get a few comments from people saying um, they didn't agree with the fact that maybe we were killing live creatures. And um, I understand that concept. Um, I'm a conservationist and a preservationist at heart. Uh, I'm not a sportsman per se. I don't hunt. I don't really fish. Um, I grew up uh, as a child fishing with my with my dad and grandfather and brother and so on but um, it really didn't stick with me as I grew up but um, you know I can understand people's concern about catching live creatures and the reality is though we all eat fish well unless you're a vegan or vegetarian we're, we're all eating fish it's just that somebody else is catching it somebody else is filleting it and preparing it we're eating it and um, I, I realize that there's, uh, you know, there's overfishing, there's poaching, there's overhunting, uh, there are uh, endangered species and all of that, and I'm I'm definitely a proponent of protecting endangered species and and um, protecting nature. However, we aren't we aren't sport fishing. We aren't uh, catching and releasing. We're out here only fishing for food that we are planning on eating, and we are depending somewhat on nature to help provide the meals that we're here to eat. We've caught northern and we've thrown the northern back. Um, we just take them off the hook and put them back in the water and they swim away. We just decided we weren't going to eat northern. So um, we made the effort to catch smallmouth bass and we've done a pretty good job with that. And you know, there's nothing really um, fresher than catching a fish and bringing it out of the water and preparing it right there and eating it. It's absolutely delicious. And um, I, for one, am very appreciative for the experience of going out with these gentlemen who have a lot of woodsman experience, uh, both in hunting and fishing, and allow me to be along and have them teach me a few things. I think that's valuable education for pretty much anyone. The Boundary Waters is no joke. If you get injured out here, you are a long, long way from any kind of medical treatment. If a bear comes into your camp and steals your food, you know, you're going to become completely dependent on nature to provide. You'll be out fishing to catch meals. You'll probably be foraging for berries. I've seen a lot of different kinds of berries that are edible here. I've definitely seen mushrooms that are edible here. And um, having those kinds of skills are very, very valuable for your survival if you're out in a place like this. So as you're watching this video, if you're thinking anything about the fishing experience and, and what we're doing out here, please take in mind why we're out here and, and why we're harvesting fish in order to be able to provide for ourselves. So a lot of these pictographs were said to have been created by the Great Ojibwe tribe and often depict dreams, dreamscapes. Some of it had suggested that uh, rock paintings represented dreams experienced by medicine men of the Grand Medicine Society. They believe some pictographs might portray historical incidences such as war, drowning tragedies, and successes in hunting parties. There's also evidence of some hunting magic where the drawings uh, of desired animals with arrows or bullets already through their hearts were thought to give the pending hunt a better chance of success. Oh, 
Okay, ready? Ten. This is your 15. crib, right? Yes. Twenty. You got two. You're coming up from the outside. There you go. I had a an old Honda um, lawnmower. You know, self-propelled. Yeah. And the self. They're good. Th they are, but the self-propelled died. Oh. And so I got on looking for YouTube on how to fix a self-propelled. There's some old boy from Alabama showing you how to. You just you get her up here like this. You gotta pull on this, and then that thing will just slide right off, and you hear a snap. <laughs> well, sometimes they break. <laughs> <laughs> like telling me how you got started in coming out to the Boundary Waters. Well, you know, I was uh, 15 years old, which it's kind of ironic. That was 50 years ago that I came up here as a scout and uh, took a trip and just loved it. Just a nine day trip. We did about 70 miles through the man chain and uh, everybody else was complaining about how hard of work it was, but I just really enjoyed it. And when I got done with the trip, I got back to Charles L. Summers canoe base and I uh, said, how can you work up here? I wanna work up here. So they said, well, we have a training program. It's called a swamper program. And you can come up and you train for two, three weeks. I think it was about two and a half weeks. And then you become a guide. So lo and behold, the next year I came up and I went through the training program, absolutely loved it, and uh, started guiding. And I guided for three years. When I was 16, I drove a Suzuki 200 from Milwaukee to Ely, which is nine hours in a car, um, 16 hours in a Suzuki 200. Uh, my dad was, was a, he let me go, but my grandparents were mad at him. My mom was mad at him. Everybody was mad at him. But it was one heck of a motorcycle ride. I'll never forget that ride. Nice. Uh, yeah. What was, kind of uh, stories you got to share about that? Well, one of the first years I guided, I found out about Dorothy's Island, which is a day and a half paddle out of Moose Lake. Um, a nurse out of Chicago came up here in the 20s with her dad, and she fell in love with it. And she stayed with the uh, um, fishing outfitters that they went to, to to go fishing. And she squatted on an island a day and a half out of Moose. Where you'd be paddling along right out in the middle of the wilderness. And this huge stop sign was on this island. And then we would stop and Dorothy made root beer. Um, and she, she had a little sign that said root beer that made Milwaukee jealous. That was <laughs> her saying. Uh, she cut ice in the winter to keep it cold all summer. And uh, then she'd sell it for 50 cents. So my scouts, I'd always tell them if we were going by there, bring money. And then we'd bring money, we'd stop and have, they didn't know why we were bringing money or what we were doing. And it was a, you know, it was like, wow, out in the middle of the wilderness. Um, and then when she passed away, the friends of Dorothy Moulter came in, disassembled her cabin and her outbuildings and reassembled them in Ely. And there's now a Dorothy Moulter Museum cool. in Ely. Cool. Uh, one of the neat things when you went there is you signed a book with your name and your date and everything at, else. At her cabin on the at island? Her, yeah, on the cabin on the yeah. island. And then when they opened up the museum, all those books are there. And you could go back and look. And back in 1968, I can find my name with my crew and everything That's else. That's cool. Yeah. So cool. it was history preserved by wish, the people. Yeah. Wish. And then in later life, I brought my family up here. And I probably brought them up here for... Well, my son started when he was three, and he finished when he was 17. And when he was five, we were on Wind Lake, and um, he was just learning how to fish. And uh, he was casting okay. Well, one of the cast went pretty much straight up in the air, hit the bow of the canoe, went straight down about a foot away from the canoe. And uh, he's reeling it up, and he catches his first fish. He caught a norther. <laughs> How big I mean, was that? Pretty uh, good size? Oh, uh, yeah, it was an eating size. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the funny thing is that um, my daughter was similar. We were on uh, North Bay, and she was out casting, and her kids are having trouble. She, I think her line was all tangled up, and the lure just kind of, you know, she cast it out, and she caught her first northern. They both caught northerns. So those were their first two fish. So you got a lot of good memories from... Oh, the, the family, when when the family gets together, my kids talk about the Quetico in the summer trips that we took. Nice. Here. How many so, times do you think you've been up here? Oh, I've been up here, oh, in 50 years. I probably 40. There might have been 10 years in there that I missed. And some of those, you've been pretty much all over the... Um, I've been in every lake in the Quetico, which is the... 
you know, provincial park north of the Boundary Waters. The Boundary Waters I haven't spent a lot of time with because we just passed through. We passed through. So now I'm spending more time in the Boundary Waters. Um, it's, there's designated campsites here where there isn't in the Quetico. Uh, there's one million people that visit the BWCA. There's 100,000 that visit the Quetico. Wow. So, nice, so, nice. Yeah. Do you this think is you'll a, keep coming up? This is a very special place for me. I will. I, I, don't, I don't know how my trips will be. They've really backed off. I mean, I'm yeah. not doing as much as I used to do. And yeah, like you said, you just bought a sailboat, right? Yeah, and I bought a sailboat. And I got to tell you, this, this has been physically a, you know, a hard trip. But, um, you know, the, re the work is always rewarded. And, and this trip has been a very rewarding trip. I mean, we've seen a lot, done yep. a lot. And yeah, I've really enjoyed it. And, you know... Uh, this place has changed my life. I mean, I cut my teeth up here, and, and I learned uh, the, the ways of the world, actually, by being a, a guide up here. And um, it kind of has stayed with me for my whole life. It has, nice. so. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, well, thanks for sharing. Yeah, hey. It's been great having you on the trip. It's been <laughs> fun. Cool. I think she's gonna clear, boys. Well, it's Thursday morning. Just got up. It's um, really cloudy today. It rained all night long, which was actually really nice. I had the best sleep since I've been out here. Hearing those raindrops falling all night long was pretty great. Woke up this morning, got out of the tent, and of course the mosquitoes are swarming. So the best place to go is down by the water where there's a breeze. So generally these campsites come with a pit toilet and a fire grate. And the pit toilets are generally way back up in the hills, uh, back in the forest. And I just thought I'd come back and show you one of these. So this is generally what you're gonna find at one of these campsites where you go to the bathroom. It's almost like jungle back here. Plenty of mosquitoes, so you wanna do your, wanna do your job quickly. There's no wasting time back here. Portage, directly ahead. Give him a I'm okay, I'm gonna go right where you are, Dave. You should be fine. It's a long one. Well. Let the games begin. First portage. We got into the forest and it started raining out. Met a couple nice people at the uh, at the water's edge there. Had a little conversation. Hello to my friends out there. Have a safe trip. Hope you find my YouTube channel. What lake is this? Uh, this is a pothole into Agnes. And Agnes is where we're going to stay tonight. So it's just a real short paddle across here. Yep, 21 rod portage on the other side. That was a very short paddle, now we're on to another portage. This one looks like we're going to climb up some good stairs. Okay, so far. What I don't do for this YouTube channel. Doing a little switcheroo. Oh, that's good. I'm the anchor man.
Well, we've arrived at our last day of camp. Really nice camp spot. Dane is setting up down here along the shore. Climb up the side here. Got a real nice camp spot. It's on a peninsula. There's a little island off to one side. Big cooking area. Real nice spot. Toast to the last day, right? I guess it is. Are you gonna give it? No. No. I think the captain's supposed to get it. Okay, for food, for raiment, for life and opportunity, for sun and rain, for water and portage trails, we thank thee, O Lord. Cheers. What do we have here? Uh, some sort of quinoa black bean Pablo Poblano pepper. Stuff. Nice. How is it? Very good. Very good. Way to go, Dave. Tell me a little bit about uh, your first trip up here, how you first found out about Boundary Waters. Well, uh, Dana and I were roommates when I was living in Milwaukee at the time. And uh, he had a huge poster of the whole Boundary Waters up on the wall. He used to tell stories about what they would do and how they'd go out. And how long ago I, was that? Oh boy, uh, late 70s, maybe around 1980, something like that. And, uh, you know, I had do, I'd done some canoeing when I was in college, and, uh, ri but it was all river canoeing, it was never this. I sort of had the wanderlust, had gone to Alaska and done the Brooks Range with a friend of mine. And it was always one of these, let's go, let's go. So we went, one year we went. My son was probably nine uh, on the first trip, and Danny and another friend and my son and I went out, and we were hooked. And every year after that, uh, my son Peter, and then another guy and his son would go up into the Quetico every year. It was pretty much eight, 10 years in a row, and it pretty much began to fall apart when the kids were off to college. And then suddenly there wasn't the time, everybody was busy and what have you. So then Dan and I would pick up trips here or there. So nice. It's, it's been fun, probably about 16 trips. Wow, 16 trips. It may 16 to maybe, might be as many as 18 for me, something like that. Wow. Special memories from some of those trips? Well, I mean, every trip has some of them, but um, you know, I, when your son goes with you for that many years in a row and sort of grows up, it it's pretty rewarding to just see how much more they can do and how much more they can do on their own, and how much better they pack and how much they pack by themselves and how much equipment they can carry and can they navigate and what have you. Become self-sufficient. Become self-sufficient. Um, we've, we've, you know, we learned a few things. One of them was never do not take the small little portage around a waterfall thinking that you're just gonna pull the canoe up. That, that does not work. Found that out the hard way. <laughs> uh, luckily no one was hurt or any of that sort of thing. But, yeah. uh, you know, I, I remember one trip when we were in the middle of the Quetico and it rained for four days. And when I say rain, I'm not talking rain, I'm talking torrential, mm -hmm. Thailand monsoon <laughs> rain. Deluge. And we learned to live with it, you know, you get, you get into it. And so every subsequent trip after that, if it would start to rain, my son would say, this isn't rain, that was rain. <laughs> You know, so, uh, you, I mean, you take a little piece of every trip. That's kind yeah. of what it comes down yeah. to. Yeah. What do you feel like uh, you've gained from coming up here for yourself, in, like, personally? Well, you, you, you certainly uh, learn to appreciate nature. Uh, you, I, I, I watch what goes on in the DNR much more closely as it relates to Boundary Waters and, and a little bit to lesser extent to the Quetico. Uh, 
Not that I don't care about the Quetico, I do. It's just, you know, I, I don't get the provincial news as much. Um, but, you know, it, it's such a piece of the fabric in this part of the Midwest. Um, there isn't a person, I swear to God, in Minnesota that you couldn't pull off of their chair and say, do you know what the BWCA is? And they would tell you, absolutely, Boundary Waters, I've been there. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of folks that go up for this kind of an experience. Some to a greater degree, some to a lesser degree. But in the end, you know, it's a natural resource that's like second to none, and it's right in my backyard. Yeah. So canoeing is a culture in Minnesota. It's a culture. It it truly is. Canoe making uh, and canoe using, fishing, uh, it's just it's part of the fabric here. Mm -hmm. That and hockey. Yeah, yeah, and then hockey. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about these trips that is very uh, accomplishment oriented. You've accomplished something in that you've schlepped 70, as you did, 70 pound packs over portages, mm -hmm. a canoe over portages. You survived in the rain for four days. Accomplishment that you navigated yourself and you didn't get lost, even when the weather was foul, even when things were going against you. Uh, I found that with my son. I found that with all the other sort of younger people that had come out, that the sense of, man, we actually did this. I mean, you read about it and you think, God, I'd love to do it, but. Mm -hmm. And to have somebody with the experience that Dan certainly has a lot more than me, but me, to take them out and just say, you know, you can do this mm -hmm. kind of thing is, uh, is pretty big. That's, that's really huge. A friend of mine and his son and me and my son, the sons were best friends in school. I mean, we, we probably did, I would say probably eight trips, eight years in a row together. And so that got pretty tight knit, mm -hmm. you know? And, and we, we kind of pushed the boundaries. We, we flew in to some very remote reaches right outside of the park. Uh, some lakes that very few people get to. Hmm. So I haven't been to every lake in the Quetico. Uh, some of the interior ones I haven't, but in uh, particularly the northwest and on the northeastern side, been to all those. And then I have paddled literally from the northern boundary to the southern boundary of the park. Wow. <laughs> I mean, there's an awful lot of stuff with the kids where we would just pull pranks on them and scare the crap out of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of memories. Yes. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. Hey, man. My pleasure. Man. Okay, so it's our last morning. It's only a half day. We should be probably getting off the trail around noon. We're gonna stay in Ely tonight, but we do have about eight portages today, believe it or not. <laughs> and one of them is actually fairly long. We're you, Dan. Where do you go? Home! Well, I'm over here now. That looks like a mess. It's all mucky.
So we're in like Agnes right there. Okay. That little spot. We're going to paddle down to the creek here. Make sure we take a right. Got the 96 rod portage. 70 rod portage. And then we're into Nina Moose Lake. Okay. And we're going to paddle straight out of Nina Moose. Right here. Moose River. Little portage, little portage. And it's hard to see, but that's the parking area right there. Okay. Well, that's half hour better than I thought. 803. Huh? 803. Oh, that's pretty good. Nice early morning. Yeah, 803. We have arrived. Portage number one. How many rods is this one? I think it's 96. 96 rods. Kind of right along the creek. All is good. Right when I said that, a mosquito went down my throat. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, it's there. It's <laughs> hey, Dave. Yes, I think you brought enough fishing tackle. We could have been out here for two weeks with that fishing tackle you brought. Well, you never know it's survival. That's right, right? And I think you got enough maps in your map case to take us all through the park. I think the odds of uh, Dana getting eaten by a bear were pretty high, so I thought it was a good idea that you brought the extra tackle. <laughs> On to our second portage. Nice shade tree there. Uh -huh. I had a group that was uh, mutinied on me. Only two portages left. Only two portages left, and there's been no mutiny on the bounty. Boys are still listening to me, kind of. What? Well, 
Well, I am because I got to get a ride for me to Duluth. <laughs> yeah. I don't know you get a ride from Dave. Dave can give you a ride. Dave ain't going out of the way. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He's counting on you to get out of the forest, too. Tell me about the legend of the Mamagueshi. In this region, believed in a little spirit called the Mamagueshi. They, so they're two to three feet high, and they were little imps. They would come in at night and turn your canoe over. They would come in at night and steal some food. And they had very, very hairy faces, which they were extremely ashamed of. So if they were ever spotted by the Indians, they would hold their heads down in the shadows of the canoe so they couldn't be seen. But the only way that the Indians and the shaman were able to sort of mitigate their impish behavior was to uh, put tobacco uh, offerings on the rocks by the painting, where you see all the painting. <clears throat> and so that way they protected themselves against the Mamagueshi in their camp. Interesting. They also, anything that was missing during the evening would have been the Mamagueshi took it. So let's say you left your bowl out, and the next morning you woke up and the bowl was gone, the Mamagueshi took it. Yeah. Or your sacks were hanging closely by the fire to, war, to to get them dry. All of a sudden they were in the fire. The Mamagueshi put it in the fire. So is that what happened to the uh, Voyageur juice on our trip? Mamagueshi's drank it. Yeah, <laughs> Mamagueshi's <laughs> drank it. <laughs> they, they sure did. <laughs> How you doing? Good, are you? Good. Good. Yeah. representation of the tannins in the water from the roots of the cedar trees. It's a white sandy beach here. You come down and just totally changes color. When you filter this water, the water you're drinking is this color. a real short portage. I think this is either the last one or the second to last one. And then we'll be off the water. There's my boys. Portage. So this is a bit longer portage. You know what they say. Don't try this at home. <laughs> Might not give us a little elevation on this one too. Because it's a longer one. I'm gonna trade off with Dana and take his canoe for him. You okay, buddy? Yep.
Yeah, this ain't so bad. Good acoustics in here. So this is the last stretch of our portages. And load up the cars. How's it going, buddy? Good, you're doing good. How you doing? Getting a little heavy. Yeah. Fourth quarter. Mind over matter. All right, well, folks, I think that's a wrap. It was an amazing trip. Six straight days of paddling and seven nights of camping out here with the two fine gentlemen, really. Uh, really enjoyed my time with these guys and um, really appreciate all the experience that I gained from uh, going with the two of them, two experienced travelers out here in the Boundary Waters. If you ever get a chance to come out here, I strongly recommend you do so. And um, I think uh, if you get an opportunity, spend a little time up here in Ely and maybe even get up to the Quetico if you have a chance and if you have the, uh, the ambition and the, uh, the adventurous lifestyle going through your blood like I do. Once again, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, spend with me here at Four Expedition. Look forward to coming at you with another episode coming soon. Take care.